Thank you very much for this invitation. Um, I've always been a great fan of the Melbourne civic tradition, so uh, I'm really delighted to be here. And I'm addressing the question of is neoliberalism destroying social democracy? Well, the simple answer is yes. <laughs> neoliberalism has been now institutionally ascendant for about 40 years. It's a historical project that's developed iteratively, but essentially it was designed to destroy all forms of public collectivism and much more specifically social democracy it, it, as distinct from communism. I think its real target was the social democratic welfare state. It's been remarkably successful, I think, um, and uh, we know how it's been eroding our own tradition of a social liberal welfare state in, in Australia, which began at the end of the 19th century. So it's best understood, in my view, as a counter-revolution in relation to the 20th century social liberal and welfare state and the idea of that kind of state. Neoliberalism is anti... Neoliberalism is anti-equality, anti-democracy, anti-unions and anti-social solidarity or collective responsibility for welfare. It began to develop in the 1920s and 1930s and one really important thing to appreciate about the neoliberals is they take ideas seriously. It was organised as a very powerful international network with the formation of the Montpellier Society in 1947 and it continued to develop and take its opportunities organising its influence through think tanks, elite networks and university departments, particularly but not only economics departments. The Institute of Public Affairs here in Melbourne is one of its flagship institutions. John Roscombe is a member of the Montpellier Society and the Heritage Foundation in the US has also been, like the IPA, enormously powerful in seeking to influence public policy and actually doing so. The aim of neoliberalism is systemic. It's totalising in its orientation. It's oriented to changing the nature of how society is institutionally and normatively ordered. The change in the nature of collective ordering is from one that's public in orientation to one that's private in orientation. And we can say simply that neoliberalism is designed to privatise society. It uses the authority of the state and the power of the institutions of government to create society in the image of the competitive market order. So neoliberalism implicates our entire way of being. It's not just a set of discrete policies that can be changed at the next election. If we're to reclaim social democracy, we have to call the neoliberal institutional order into question and rebuild a social democratic institutional order. So what is neoliberalism? I think it's an anti-political political philosophy. It assumes the appearance of economics, but it's actually an entire philosophy oriented to the question of what is a human being and how modern human society should be organised. As Margaret Thatcher put it in 1981, economics are the method, but the object is to change the heart and soul. It assumes the appearance of economics because its central premise is that human conduct, at least of the modern kind, is oriented to the competitive pursuit of private interest. Therefore, the most appropriate arena for human conduct is a competitive market economy. Hayek, Friedrich Hayek, is the leading neoliberal philosopher. He argues that the market economy is a giant information processor and on that premise, all forms, all forms of public planning are rejected. The information processing capacity of the market far exceeds that of any human mind, whether it's one mind or the combined effect of many minds. It's the price mechanism that mediates information flows in the market economy. And this proposition is enormously radical. Philip Murawski emphasises how radical it is in epistemological terms. It corrodes all traditional and, and rational substantive modes of valuing. 
the proposition is that value is established when people are prepared to pay for something offered in the context of a competitive market economy. So value is reduced essentially to a form of subjectivism, subjective consumer preference. And here we can see why the communications profession has become so powerful and why Philip Morosky links neoliberalism to fake news. It actually offers a very radical relativism. In the neoliberal framework, there's no such thing as publicly interested or disinterested conduct. Neoliberals reject the Enlightenment idea of a disinterested rationalism as this underwrites the project of both collective and individual self-determination. They reject the democratic Enlightenment ideal of public conversation based on understanding of reasons or justifications for views, positions and recommendations for action. A public conversation within which we listen to and learn from each other. On the premise that people value what they're willing to pay for, neoliberals argue that the value of knowledge and research is established in the marketplace. Philip Morawski comments, quote, when truth came to be defined as whatever sells, then it ceases to exert any independent regulatory force in epistemology, unquote. Neoliberals distrust what they call producer interest. They argue that producers, and this includes all professional groups and associations, engage in uncompetitive behaviour if they're permitted to do so, and if they're permitted, they'll capture institutions, convert such capture into rent-seeking, and so on. And the only way to ensure that producers are efficient is to make sure they're subject to market competition. So there's a, a profound animus against all forms of professionalism in neoliberalism. The distrust of producer interest is in the name of consumer sovereignty. The argument is that if producers are forced by the dynamics of competition to be more efficient and more innovative, this benefits the consumer. But interestingly, the championship of consumer sovereignty doesn't stop neoliberals supporting the power of the large corporation. Uh, the Chicago School, in fact, argued that since the corporation is subjected to competition, it, it doesn't matter if it's very powerful. And since they generally recommend that society be organised in terms of a market order, they are quite prepared to justify access of large corporations to government policy making. It's an anti-political political philosophy because it attacks what it sees as political interference with the freedom of private property. This is the reason why neoliberalism sidelines democracy in favour of a pro-market executive style of government. Well, how has neoliberalism impacted on our institutional design and the approach to public policy? Let me just take four areas. Firstly, the public service, and perhaps some of you have been or are in the public service. Conceptually, neoliberalism cannot embrace the idea of public office or public ethics. Neoliberalism places the very idea of public service under erasure, precisely because it represents the kind of disinterested rational conduct that its own epistemology cannot accommodate. It places the idea of public service under erasure in a number of ways. Firstly, on the view of elections as a competitive political marketplace where voters get to assert their preference, the winner of the election is accorded executive authority in relation to the conduct of government. Specifically, the relationship between the government of the day and public service is understood in terms of agency theory, namely the right of the principal to command the agent and I've heard someone from the IPA on the drum use agency theory in precisely this way. The minister has the right to command the public service, servant. This trashes the professional independence of the public servant, service and it justifies the politicisation of the top level of the public service uh, where uh, people at the top level are disciplined by means of 
fixed-term performance contracts, often highly remunerated because, of course, if you're going to have good people, um, the, the money must be such as to draw them from the private sector. Secondly, given the understanding that government activity is inherently uncompetitive, as much as possible of government activity is marketised and contracted out to private agents. This transforms the work of government. Public servants are no longer program managers interacting with representatives and members of the public in the design, delivery and evaluation of public programs. Instead, the Australian Public Service, as all of them, has, has become less directly involved in service delivery, more geared toward policy, regulatory and contract management. It's also been enormously thinned out, its, its numbers reduced. The ethos of public service is replaced by one of market design, market management and market rules. And this is why in Australia the Productivity Commission has the premier role in the development of public policy and its evaluation. If you haven't had a look at the Productivity Commission's website recently, do take a look. It will be very instructive. Its scope in relation to public policy is amazing. Fourthly, the activity of government is redesigned on business lines and there's a blurring of the lines of difference between public and private sectors. And finally, the professional vocation of public service is replaced by a technocratic concept of project work instead of long-term service that builds relationships with communities, grows program continuity, grows institutional memory and policy expertise, context in different management skills in relation to short-term project-based teams prevail. And you'll all have stories of how people on the ground meet one public servant one day and another the next day. There's no continuity in those relationships. Well, if one thinks that the experience, capacity and morale of the public service is a central condition of good government, then we have very, very good reason to worry. There's no doubt, and it's not just me saying it, uh, very senior people who have been in the Australian Public Service are saying it too. The capacity of government as reflected in public service skills and competence has severely decreased. Now let me come to the universities. As we have said, neoliberalism suggests that the only things worth valuing are those that sell. And this has justified the creation of a competitive market in university education where student choice has become the driver of how funding operates as a combination of public subsidy and student fees. This has involved a progressive reduction of per capita public funding with a parallel shift of increased reliance on private funding. And the big uh, doorway for that in the Australian system was the uh, development of a full fee foreign student market. That was the Trojan horse. The impact of the marketisation of university education on its quality is insufficiently recognised and discussed. It has certainly impacted on the nature and structuring of academic work with significantly increased and ongoing casualisation of the academic workforce, decrease in the professional autonomy of academics and the destruction of academic collegial governance. The marketisation of the university also justifies the shift away from public funding of disinterested public interest research in the direction of a form of public-private partnership in research funding. Translational research is the name given to a funding approach that brings commercial partners such as Big Pharma into collaboration with universities to accelerate the application of scientific research. Mark Robinson proposes that translational science and medicine involves corporations shifting from in-house research capacity to externalising that capacity and its risks by relying on university research partners. This trend, of course, means the commercialisation of science. And that will impact on how universities are ranked, how academic promotion operates, and what knowledge disciplines are valued. It's this trend that explains the overhaul of the CSIRO. And I'm sure in this town, not far away, there are examples that could be talked about. Finally, in being invited to become entrepreneurs, some academics will take the opportunity to enrich themselves in becoming consultants to cons corporate clients. Eddie Nikar and Robert Van Horn 
tell the story of how the very powerful, enormously powerful, Chicago neoliberal school established Lexicon in 1977 to offer advice to law firms representing corporate clients facing antitrust action or negative regulatory judgments. The aim of these neoliberal thinkers was to transform the regulatory order so that it did not interfere with the corporate pursuit of profit. Lexicon became a powerful vehicle of corporate patronage for the Chicago neoliberal school. Lexicon provided an avenue for collaboration between the academy and the corporation, a powerful tool for rewriting re regulation, as well as a career route for researchers to tack between the academy, consult consulting, think tank, tanks, private equity, and all the way back again. Now let's come to human services, and I know that some of you have, very, have had a very long history and engagement with human services. The human services, new language, refer to the public services that developed as distinct aspects of the welfare state. Health, education, housing, disability, aged care, migrant settlement services, early childhood services, and so on. In many cases, these services were delivered by not-for-profit community agencies working in close collaboration with government as the public funder and manager of the relevant program. And marvellous, marvellous work has been done under this kind of framework. The ethos of these welfare state services was one of service to the public. They were services that citizens should have access to as a matter of right because such access constitutes what T.H. Marshall called a baseline of civilised living. In other words, a baseline that enables each individual to enjoy the status of a citizen or free being, as he put it, and to be equal to all other citizens or free beings. The values that framed such service provision were access, equity, efficiency and citizen participation or voice. Now in Australia, and I mean, this, I find this enormously shocking and most people don't know it's happened. These services have been placed within the neoliberal institutional framework of competition policy. The Productivity Commission has been given the task of implementing the recent competition policy review led by Professor Ian Harper. Services will have to compete for, cons for consumer choice or its proxy within a competitive markets setting. NDIS is being designed along these lines. We've already experienced of what this means because employment services were put on this market competitive basis some time ago. And what it does mean is that services compete on price, they're forced to, which means there's a built-in incentive to reduce staff costs. The labour force is increasingly casualised, training and supervision drop out of the picture, and of course the management and marketing positions in these services increase uh, uh, with um, huge pay disparity between those in management and marketing and those who are doing work on the ground. The ethos of business management displaces the civil and community oriented ethos of the not-for-profits. Even if the not-for-profits want to keep their proud tradition of community service, they're forced to commercialise and to corporatise in order to become effective market competitors. And in fact, they go for market share, and so you see the more successful not-for-profits becoming ginormous organisations. And of course, the market is open to for-profit agencies, including multinational corporations. Smaller community-embedded services don't have the business infrastructure and scale to compete. They either go under, or as in New South Wales, they were instructed to be swallowed up um, by large corporate agencies in the case of the um, domestic violence, uh, the refuges. The institutions we need to retrieve are, firstly, firstly, sovereignty or the state. Understood as the name we give to the absolute authority of the political relations established between a people and its governing institutions. I take that formulation from Martin Lachlan, I'll say it again. What is sovereignty? It's the name we give to the absolute authority of the political relations established between a people and its governing institutions. Put differently, this is the institutional principle of the primacy of the political 
in the ordering of relationships and conduct. If you want a public container for social life, then you have to be talking about the primacy of the political. The second institution is what Ruth Dukes calls the labour constitution. In other words, the democratisation of the relationship between capital and labour, uh, which was enshrined in our um, uh, conciliation and arbitration system for a long time. This means the institutional validation of the role of unions in representing and organising workers. And it also means the public regulation of the conditions and remuneration of work. The third institution is that of social democratic macroeconomic management, including the guiding aim of full employment. We really, really, really must resist that extraordinary fatalism which is talking about the automation of all jobs as though this is some kind of giant wave which is simply going to unfold without human intention or action. That is a nonsense. How we use technology is up to us. The fourth institution is a mixed economy. The fifth institution is public welfare services that enable people to equally enjoy the status of citizenship and to share a common citizen experience. And the sixth institution is a progressive taxation system. Neoliberalism is failing human society on all levels. It's bringing our entire institutional order into disrepute, and this is eroding that most precious ingredient of human relationships, trust. This is a very dangerous development, as we can see. Social democracy was, and it is, the alternative to market liberalism. It is time we reclaim it, and the ethical and rational institutional ordering of human relationships for which it stands. Thank you.